Take your Bible. Psalm 102. Uh, to this afternoon, um, we're in the book of Genesis 6, and there's a message there that I think God's laid on my heart to preach about um, the theme of Genesis 6. There's several things there. The sons of God, daughters of men, the giants, and all that stuff. The reason why God flooded the world, he gave the reasons in Genesis 6. But I think uh, this afternoon, uh, first of all, I'm going to take a nap if I can. Uh, sleep a little bit. I've not been sleeping much the last couple nights, but I, I'm hearing that from a lot of people. They can't sleep. A lot of things get them troubled. What's going on in the world gets us troubled. And uh, so it's, I guess it's God's plan that I'm preaching or teaching on anxiety, depression, stress, fear, worry, um, because a lot of people are dealing with it very, for various reasons. Um, yeah, amen. Um, but tonight, I think God's laid on my heart to deal with being prepared. Being prepared. If you saw videos this morning of store shelves, okay, this is how people react, okay? Now, our forefathers didn't buy food at the store. They grew it. They kept it. They stored it themselves. That's how they lived. Okay? I, I know we're not going back to that. It's a different world we live in. But it, I don't believe that it hurts to be prepared. Physically and spiritually. The, when I, I read this, I read this this morning, or last night sometime, but it was Hebrews, and it was talking about, by faith, Noah. And the Bible says that it was through fear. Fear moved him to prepare the ark for himself and his family. It was fear that did that. We don't know what's coming. We don't know. And you hear a lot of people online, they're saying this is going, the rapture is going to happen any day, don't worry about it. I don't know that, and they don't either. Okay, so I don't think it hurts to be prepared. I don't think it does. And I think God's wisdom will show us that. Let me read Psalm 102. Uh, this was something that God laid on my heart. This is for those who are worried. Psalm 102, hear my prayer, O Lord, and let my cry come unto thee. Hide not thy face from me in the day when I'm in trouble. Incline thine ear unto me in the day when I call, answer me speedily. Isn't that how you want God to answer you? I need an answer now, God. Be careful, because sometimes you won't like the answer. I've had that happen. I read the Bible and I went, I, God, that's not what I wanted to hear. God said, tough. And that's exactly what happened. Verse 3, for my days are consumed like smoke and my bones are burned as an hearth. My heart is smitten and withered like grass so that I forget to eat my bread. That's fear. Fear does that. Depression does that. My heart is smitten and withered like grass. It means we don't have the strength of, of heart. By reason of the voice of my groanings, my bones cleave to my skin. I'm like a pelican in the wilderness and I'm like an owl of the desert. I watch and am as a sparrow alone upon the housetop. Mine enemies reproach me all the day. And they that are mad against me, mad means crazy headed, not angry, means they're nuts. They are mad against me, are sworn against me. And I'm telling you, we've got enemies against God's people in this country. We have them. And they, they have shown us their anger, and their willingness to slay because of their hatred. This is real. I want you to understand something. Everybody look up here. You are going to die. You are going to die. When? Who cares? You're going to die. Okay? 
Either sickness is going to take you, the ravages of old age, accidents, or somebody will kill you. You're going to die. I'd rather it be for God and country than to be wasted. Amen? I'd rather die for something. Um, verse 9, For I've eaten ashes like bread and mingled my drink with weeping. Because of thine indignation and thy wrath, for thou hast lifted me up and cast me down. My days are like a shadow that declineth. I'm, like, I'm withered like grass. But thou, O Lord, shalt endure forever. Underline that. So if you are in the ark, did the ark survive? Were there any leaks in it? Did it, did it sink? It did exactly what God said it would do. It was for the saving of the seed and the saving of his family. And God's good at both of them. He's been doing it for thousands of years. But thou, O Lord, shalt endure forever in thy remembrance unto all generations. We of this generation need to teach that generation and that generation how faith really works. Faith is not displayed when things are going well. Faith is best displayed when things are not going well. And we're going to teach these young people how God will get us through. Because God forbid, but what they may face in their lifetime may be far worse than what we go through. They're going to need it. Thou shalt arise, verse 13, and have mercy upon Zion for the time to favor her. Yea, the set time has come. For thy servants take pleasure in her stones and favor the dust thereof. You know what Zion is? Church! This is Zion. This is the house of God. This is the dwelling place of God. For thy servants take pleasure in her stones, how she's built in the favor and favor the dust thereof. You don't like the dirty church? Thank God you got one to go to. Amen. So the heathen shall fear the name of the Lord. We don't see, we don't see that right now, do we? We don't see Nancy Pelosi fearing God by slipping an abortion bill in. She don't fear God. She don't fear nobody yet. Yet. She's about to. Don't you believe what God said? She's going to stand before God and tremble one of these days. Okay? So the heathen shall fear the name of the Lord and all the, thing, all the kings of the earth thy glory. When the Lord shall build up Zion, he shall appear in his glory. He will regard the prayer of the destitute and not despise their prayer. This shall be written. Listen, this is what I said. This shall be written for the generation to come. And the people which shall be created shall praise the Lord. That's the babies haven't been born yet. For he hath looked down from the height of his sanctuary from heaven did the Lord behold the earth to hear the groaning of the prisoner, to loose those that are appointed to death, to declare the name of the Lord in Zion. This is the house of the Lord and his, his praise in Jerusalem. This is Jerusalem. Um... When the people are gathered together, that's us here and the kingdoms to serve the Lord. He weak, listen to this, verse 23. Understand how God works. He weakened, my, he weakened my strength in the way. He shortened my days. I said, oh my God, take me not away in the midst of my days, thy years and throughout all generations. I've asked God before. To die. To die. God, it's better than to go through this. Surely it is. But then God strengthens your heart and you say, take me not away in the midst of my days. God, if it ain't time for me to go, I don't want to go. Of old, thou hast laid the foundation of the earth and the heavens are the work of thy hands. Think about what God created. And he did all that without your help. Amen? We, in fact, we're the last ones. He put everything on this earth ahead of us to show us he didn't need us. They, verse 26, they shall perish, but thou shalt endure. Yea, all of them shall wax old like a garment. As a vesture shalt thou change them and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years 
shall have no end. The children of thy servants shall continue and their seed shall be established before thee. I'm telling you, God's not going to quit. Wrap that around your heart. Let that be like a, a gird. Okay, a girdle isn't just something women wear. It's the gird, our strength. People, guys wear back brace to strengthen their area here so they can hold up more and do more. It strengthens them, and that's what that for. And we're to have our loins girt about with what? Truth. Okay? So you're going to hear the lies on TV. You're going to read lies on the Internet from two different sides. The liberals telling you you need to trust the government, yeah, this is all bad, uh, we need to throw out Trump, we need to get in Joe Biden, <laughs> who cannot finish a sentence. Something wrong with that man's head. And I don't trust him. Okay? They'll tell you that we need to do all that. But then you got people on the other side who are telling you, oh, this is it right here, this is the end. The rapture's going to happen, or this is, tribulation's going to start, or this is the wrath of God, or whatever. People, I'm telling you, get this in your heart and let it strengthen you. Amen? Now, stress. Um, I read this, uh, where was we? 2 Thessalonians 2. I read this in Sunday school. And it goes along with what I've been saying on the issue of stress, depression, fear, anxiety. The Bible word is distress. Um, sadness, fear, all of those words. Afraid. Look those words up in your Bible. King James Bible, look them up. Um, in 2 Thessalonians 2, look at what Paul said. Verse 1, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, that be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled. Shaken in mind is fear, anxiety, depression, stress, things like that. Everything that we're seeing, they're telling us how bad it's going to be or how bad it is. And, and it's going to, they're saying it's going to get worse. And you go to the store and there's nothing to eat. And there's no, there's no toilet paper, in, which I don't get that. It's not that kind of flu where you need 40 rolls of toilet paper. Okay? Kleenexes, I understand. But toilet paper, I just don't get it. But anyway, so fear wraps around our heart. And notice what he said. Neither by spirit, I'm telling you, spirits love to make people afraid. God said he's going to send a nation of fierce countenance. That means they're mean looking. And they mean to instill fear in people's hearts. Part of depression and anxiety is spiritual and it must be dealt with in a spiritual way you can take medicines for certain types but that may not deal with the spiritual aspect of it it may help it because i believe spirits sense when a person is down when a person feels defeated or whatever i believe spirits jump on them like flies on stink Okay, and what do flies do when they find stink? They reproduce. They make more of them. That's how, listen, that's how it works. So the spiritual part must be dealt with in the right fashion. So the causes, again, go over this. Situational, like now. And I'm getting a lot of emails. A lot of people are telling me, I'm worried about this. This they're, because they're watching the news or they're reading the internet and it's making them scared. It's freaking them out. Okay? Christina, I'll never forget 9-11. You called me. That's when God really dealt with her. And she said, I'm, I'm scared to death. I said, you need to be. I did. I said, just like that to her. I said, you should be. 
And I said, now, tomorrow night in church, she said, I'm not waiting till tomorrow night. I've been waiting years to hear that. Fear is a motivator. David said, and I, will I got this verse in my notes, what time I am afraid. He didn't say, it's a sin to be afraid. He did not say that. He said, what time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. Fear, God will bring this about in situations to bring us to our knees. How's he, I prayed for our nation. How's God going to do it? How did God always do it? He brought the nation down to their knees out of fear. That's how it happened. How did you get saved? Fear. You were fearing the wrath of Almighty God and said, I, I, I don't want to go there. And that's what motivated you to get right with God. So situational, seasonal, like days like this, good grief. Come on, son, do something. Physical, there are physical issues. Mind, could be nerves, could be hormones, could be any number of physical afflictions can cause depression, either acute or chronic. Acute means happens every now and then. Chronic, it's every day. Some people deal with this every day. So there are physical aspects to it. And it is not wrong to seek professional help. As long as it's the right help, it's not wrong. Don't let anybody tell you it is. I'm not a doctor, and neither is the people you listening to on the internet. They ain't doctors. They don't know what they're talking about. Don't trust them. Okay? Sinful. Sins will cause depression because guilt will bring it. Spiritual, we dealt with that. Um, let's pray. And then we're going to look at some people in the Bible that are just like us. Okay? Father in heaven, I, I'm asking God for your help to teach. Lord, my body's tired, my mind's tired. And Father, these people, God, they're tired. They're, they're in fear. Some have, can't sleep. And Father, these are things, God, that we have to, we have to come to you with what's going on because we can't make it go away. We can't make ourselves sleep any more than we can stop ourselves from eating and breathing. Father, if we could do it ourselves, we would have done it already, but we can't. So Father, we have to call upon you. And that's probably why we're feeling this way anyway. Is so that we'll call and rely upon you. So Father, show us, God, that these great people in the Bible, that we're going to meet one of these days, you wrote about them and you told the truth about them. That they dealt with what we're dealing with. We're just like them. So, Father, teach us, God, what you taught them and use them for examples and examples unto us who live in these days. Bless your word, God. Bless your people, we pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, turn to, turn to, uh, turn to the book of Elijah. <laughs> Some of you are going. First Hezekiah, here we go. First Kings, turn there. First Kings 19. Now, this, here's Elijah. Let me set this up for you. Here's Elijah on the heels of his greatest victory. He defeated the 400 prophets of Baal, 450 prophets of Jezebel. He defeated every one of them in one day. And what did he do? Prayed one time. He prayed one time. The guys, the, the prophets of Baal were screaming to Baal all day long, cutting themselves, dancing around like a bunch of wild, crazy savages, dancing around and trying to, show, trying to get God's attention. And Elijah mocked them. He said, what, is your God asleep? What is it? Do you need waking up? Believe it or not, there are gods who sleep. Our God doesn't. Okay? 
their God was asleep and he couldn't do anything. And they tried all day long. And Elijah said, pour water on this thing. Keep pouring it until I say stop. They poured, I think, 12 barrels of water down on this thing. And then Elijah prayed one time. God, show them, show them who's God. Boom. Consumed the, consumed the sacrifice, the altar, licked up all the water. It was gone. And everybody said, God, he is the God. The Lord, he is the God. And they had all the prophets of Jezebel, all the prophets of Baal slaughtered all that day. They're gone. Greatest victory. And then he heard, Jezebel's looking for you to kill you. She said that God do to me and worse if I don't kill him by the end of the day. And that struck, he, he was not high then on the elation of his victory. Pumped full of adrenaline. He ran off and hid from her. That's the setup for this. 1 Kings 19 verse 4. These are Bible characters who struggle with depression. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. Wilderness is where you are when you're depressed. Because ain't nobody around that can help. Or you think that. Or you shun everybody. Or you, get every, you push everybody away from you. So that's what he did. He ran off. A day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree and he requested for himself that he might die. Been there. I've been there. And he said, It is enough. Now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. And as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, behold, then an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. Well, that's sweet, isn't it? See, depression, remember, that, remember the nerves that go down from your brain. They go directly from your brain to your heart, your lungs, and your bowels. They're called the vagus nerves. When you are in fear or stressed or depressed, you get that sick feeling here. Right? You ever had it? When you hear bad news. You get sick. Somebody offers you something to eat. I can't eat. Why? I'm worried. I'm worried. We say worried sick. And that's for what we mean. And here is Elijah now who is just like us. The Bible says a man of like passions as us. On the heels of the greatest, my goodness, if I would have won this thing, I'd be dancing and shouting all over the street, Maybe. Or I might be just like Elijah. As soon as he found out Jezebel wanted him dead, he ran off and hid. And he said, God, just kill me. Just, just kill me now. I'm not better. And see, what he was thinking was, even though he won this deal with the prophets of Baal, he still thinks nobody's listening and nobody's serving God. And let me tell you something. From my point of view, the preacher... There's nothing that eats at me worse than the thought that nobody's listening to what I say. I'm telling you, that eats me up. Okay? And I've felt it before. Ain't nobody listening to me. Why do I bother? Okay? That happens. If you're a man of God, that happens. Every preacher struggles with it. Okay? Or the honest ones do. The arrogant ones who've got 5,000 people sitting there, they don't care as long as the money comes in. They don't care. I'm just telling you how, the hire, there's a difference between the shepherds and the hirelings. Hirelings will lead the sheep when the times get rough. And I've seen pastors, when things get shaking in the church. And I grew up in a denomination where the lifespan of a preacher in any given church was about three years. And after about three years, he ran off, went somewhere else. Took another congregation. I don't know how in the world I've been here so long. I have no idea. I guess God won't let me leave. Huh? Thank you, Roy. I appreciate that. Because I've been here. 
God, just take away my life. But see, there was something he didn't know, wasn't there? There's something he didn't know. He thought it's all over with, it's it. This is the, this is the tribulation. Everybody's going to turn away from God. I'm just ready to go home in the rapture. That's what he was thinking. And by the way, Elijah got raptured. God didn't even honor the thing about take away his life. He's still alive. He never died. Never died. Now, watch this, verse 9. He came hither into his... The angel touched him. What you need is an angel to touch you. And I believe in the ministry of angels. I believe in them. They're there as God's ministering spirits to minister to those to whom righteousness has come. So I believe in that. Okay? What you don't see while the dogs and the wolves and the lions are snarling at you is that you are encompassed about by an innumerable company of angels, all with flaming swords in their hands saying, Get back! I'll kill you, I'll cut your head off. I'm going to anyway one of these days. So the angel touched him and said, Arise and eat. Eat. Get some bread in you. Get some carbs in you. Sugars and get, get some energy. So verse 9, He came hither unto a cave and lodged there. Amen. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I've been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel forsaken thy covenant, and they've thrown down thine altars. I'm glad we still keep in ours. We're going to hang on to these. We're not going to get rid of them. They're the place where we come and lay it down at the cross. Amen? And they've thrown down the altars and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I, only am left. And they seek my life to take it away. He was wrong. He was wrong. He thought he was the only one left. And if we're not careful, we'll think that. We'll think, God, ain't nobody serving us, serving you but us. We're the only church left. We might as well just fold it up. And God said, I've got 7,000 reserved that have never bowed down to kiss Baal. I've got them reserved. They've never bowed down to Baal. They've worshipped me. Elijah, you don't know it, but I do. Trust me. Don't trust what you're dreaming up in your head. Because that was a lie. Where did he get that from? His head made that up, that he was the only one serving God, nobody was left, so God might as well just take me and just flood the earth again, do it all over again. He was wrong in that. And sometimes things will lie to you. So verse 14, he said, I've been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts because in the children of Israel forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thy altars and slain thy prophets with the sword, and I, even I only am left. Did I already read that? No. And they seek my life to take it away. So... He has been where some of you are. Quit looking for the rapture or death. It's not time yet. God's not done. You've got people that you still want to see saved, don't you? then isn't it worth what you're going through if they get right? I mean, look at my poor daughter back there. Take, put your lip out. Everybody look at her. Put your lip out. I hate to tell her this, but it's not time yet. Okay? And what she's going through is the birthing sorrows. And I'm telling you, from a biblical standpoint, nothing gets birthed but through sorrows. You ponder that for a while. You think of the joy now that she's going to have when she has, finally has this child. Standing upright or flipped upside down, he's, it's going to happen. Okay? And then all of that 
that she went through will be gone away in a moment for the joy that the man-child has been born. That's what Jesus said in John 16. Okay? This life is a life of sorrows. And everybody in the Bible went through it. That's why they're written down for us so that we, through sorrows, can attain great joy. Amen? Now, turn to 1 Samuel 1. Let's look at Hannah. Here's another one. And by the way, it's about a baby. It's about a baby. A baby that she can't have. Here's what happens. And I know this for a fact. What happens is, we say amen when the preacher preaches and he says good words and he says somebody say amen and you say amen and we sound spiritual. But the truth of it is, there are times when we do believe that there are things God cannot do. Hannah could not have a child, neither could Sarah. Why do you think God waited till she was 90? Sister Betty, can I ask how old you are? Dear sister. 80. I can't see you having a baby right now. <laughs> and you ain't 90. I can't see it. Why do you think God waited until Sarah was 90 years old to show you, I can do it. I can do it. You don't have to, it's not up to you. Sarah, Sarah made the mistake of thinking in God's place, didn't she? Oh, I think God wants you to <clears throat> go into Hagar. Now, I, I'm not saying, you know, that you just, but this, this one time it'll be okay. And it wasn't. And God had to end up chasing her and that baby away. Run them off. Because that was not his plan. That was us interfering with God. You know what God's telling us to do right now? Wait. Wait. Are you going to get that virus? Are you? I don't know. I've got to go to the airport Thursday. I got to sit while everybody passes by me on the plane rubbing me with their... That's gross. And then you got to pray for all these people that work in gas stations and grocery stores because everybody, when they pull money out of their wallet, they go. They pray for these people. Amen. Are you going to get this thing or not? Who knows? Wait. What else are you going to do? Wait. So 1 Samuel 1, verse 4. When the time was that Elkanah offered, he gave to Peninnah his wife and to all her sons and her daughters portions. But unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion. Who did he really love here? Hannah. I mean, Peninnah boasted against Hannah, but the thing of it was, Peninnah was not who Elkanah really loved. She just imagined it. Since she was the one putting out the babies, that she was the honored wife. But she wasn't. Hannah was. I mean, he gave something to Peninnah and all the children. But what did he give to Hannah? It was more. So when Peninnah asked for money to go to the store, he gave her 20 bucks. When Hannah asked for money, she got a hundred. Because he loved her more. Okay? But the Lord shut up her womb. Who did? God did. And he did it for a reason. Verse 6, and her adversary. Who's your adversary? Satan is. Her adversary also provoked her sore for to make her fret. That's another word. Fret is fear, anxiety, depression, stress, worry. 
worry. Peninnah's probably feeling her head like, hmm, Elkanah was with me all last week. Hmm. You know how some women are, they like to rub everybody's nose in it. And some men too. Okay? Whew, I just saved myself there, didn't I? But that's what was happening here. She was deliberate in this. Peninnah hated her guts because the Lord has shut up her womb. It wasn't Han what did Hannah do? Nothing. Sometimes you will get eat up. God let it to happen to Job. God let it happen to Paul. God let it happen to his only begotten son, Jesus. God let it happen to Hannah. And God will let it happen to you. Think not that God does not love you. Because what has he given you more than he has given the rest of this world? His only begotten son, Jesus, and his grace. And we didn't get what we really deserved, did we? So, verse 7, as he did so year by year, when she went up to the house of the Lord, she provoked her, and therefore she wept and did not eat. There's what we, that's what we saw. Then said Elkanah, her husband, to her, Hannah, why weepest thou, and why eatest thou not? Why is thy heart grieved? Grieve is another. You don't grieve what you don't love. But you grieve over things and people that you love. You worry about them. You worry about your children, worry about your grandchildren, worry about your husband or your wife, or you worry about your church, you worry about your country. You grieve over it because you love it. Okay? And he said, um, Am I not better th to thee than ten sons? Elkanah, let me give you some advice. Don't ever ask a woman that. When she's crying. Am I not a good husband to you? Elkanah, shh. That's not helping. Uh, by the way, he said ten sons. Now think about this for a minute. What's 10 mean in the Bible? The law, commandments. And isn't having Christ better than the law? Isn't it better to have mercy and forgiveness than it is to try to keep the law, to keep God happy? See, you see what that means now? The grace that God has given you, even when you are distressed, is better then his demands that you keep the law because you can't do it. You're weak. So Hannah rose up, verse 9, after they had eaten in Shiloh and after they had drunk. Now Eli the priest sat upon a seat by a post of the temple of the Lord, and she was in bitterness of soul and prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. There's no shame in that. There's no shame in weeping. No shame in it. Everybody has to weep. Everybody has to. Some are just better at it than others. But you have to weep sometimes. Get it out. And she vowed a vow and, and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid, affliction. There's another word for you to look up. Look on the affliction of thine handmaid and remember me and not forget thine handmaid. But what thou... Give unto thine handmaid a man-child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. She's promising that he's going to be like John the Baptist, Samson, and Jesus. Samuel's a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the promised child. To fret means to tease, to irritate, to vex, to make angry. All of those things. Young people, young people, listen to me. Kids, listen to me. You're going to get teased. You're going to get made fun of. I didn't like it. I went running home crying to mom or my sister. And my sister always went after them boys on the bus that teased me. You leave my brother alone, I'll tear your head off. They scared of her. They still are. But I had to endure that. I was timid, shy, not very sure of myself or my place. And um, had a lot of mean things said. 
to me, a lot. And I just put up with it. Still do, by the way. Still do. I got people out there that they aggravate me to death. They're always online listening to everything I say to make fun of me or to irritate me somehow or to create some kind of chaos in what we're doing. And they never go away. I figured, just leave them alone, they'll go away. And some of them have never. But you're going to gonna have to endure that, guys. Young people, you're going to have to endure it. Young people online, you're going to have to... People are going to make fun of you. Especially when your parents are raising you to live for the Bible and their parents aren't. Their parents are pushing for legalized marijuana because they're already smoking it. And your mom and dad's trying to keep you away from that. Okay? But this is what Hannah went through. Did God do something for her? Gave her a baby. But he didn't just give her one because she gave him to the Lord. When she weaned him, she turned him right over to Eli. Eli's got to raise this toddler now. But he turned out to be the greatest prophet. Anointed Saul, then anointed David, then died. And God blessed him. Okay? And then she had the consolation children. She had more children after that that she got to keep. The one she gave away, she, she gave away one and got, what was that, I think five more? Something like that? I'm just saying, these people have endured this. These are the heroes in the Bible. And the whole of chapter 2 of 1 Samuel is her song to the Lord, her song of joy, because she was a woman forsaken, and God, who was angry at her for a while, turned and gave her love and repentance, and now she's not sorrowful anymore. Who else? Jeremiah. Turn to Lamentations 1. I'll show you Jeremiah. They called Jeremiah the weeping prophet. I've got more here than what I've got time to give out on this. Um, where is Lamentations? Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations. It's that one there before Ezekiel. Chapter 1. Look at, look at Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. Verse 20. Behold, O Lord, I am, for I am in distress. My bowels are troubled. That's what I said. God created the response to things that we hear that make us angry or make us fearful or trouble us so that it affects our heart, it affects our lungs, it affects our bowels. It makes us, sometimes we hear it and we have to go, have to, go to the bathroom. Sometimes sooner than we want. It happens. We get in distress. Our bowels are troubled. My heart is turned within me, for I have grievously rebelled. Abroad the sword bereaveth. At home there is as death. They have heard that I sigh. Notice the, de this is Webster's definition. This is built into that Bible search software. A single deep respiration, long breath, the inhaling of large quantity of air that more than usual and the sudden emission of it. And I've noticed this about me. I will, on days when I am feeling it, I'll do that all day long. It happens. I have no control over that. This is an effort of nature to dilate the lungs and give vigor to the circulation of the blood. It's a natural reaction. When the action of the heart and arteries is languid from grief, depression of spirits. Look what Webster said. Depression of spirits. Weakness or want of exercise. Hence, sighs are indications of grief, of debility. Grief debilitates you. You know what that word means, don't you? Can't do nothing. Can't even hardly get out of bed on some days. Amen. They have heard that I sigh, there is none to comfort me. All mine enemies have heard of my trouble. They are glad that thou hast done it. There are people right now 
that have been part of this church that are waiting for me to collapse. They've said it. They're waiting for me to fall away. And they said, this church will never survive. That's what they said. It ain't up to them. It ain't up to them. But they are glad that thou hast done it. Thou wilt bring the day that thou hast called, and they shall be like unto me. Look at what God said to your enemies. God said, the ones who are giving it to you, one of these days, they're going to get it. Chuck Schumer will never see it coming, will he? You know what he said, don't you? He made a threat. Now, you've got to understand, we have separation of powers in this country. The Senate does not control the judiciary, does not control what the judges determine. That's supposed to be a separation of powers. And Chuck Schumer threatened to, threatened violence against two Supreme Court justices in front of a crowd of angry baby killers. If they will kill children, they'll slaughter judges. And he's not repented of it. He's not even admitted that he said it. And it's plain language. Everybody heard it. And I'm just saying, people... You're afraid that your enemies are going to get away with what they're doing to you? They won't. God won't let them. If he does, he's not the righteous judge that we thought he was, and I won't serve him. But he's not that way, people. He's not. So we've heard from Elijah, whom God translated. We've heard from Hannah, whom God blessed with a child. We've heard from Jeremiah, whom God said, from the time you were in the womb, Jeremiah, I called thee. And God put his, took his words and put them in Jeremiah's mouth, and he said, now go speak what I say to these people. Jeremiah, one of the greatest prophets in the Old Testament. But he wept, he cried, he sighed. Okay? It's part of it. It's part of who we are and what God has called us to be. We're not going to be the smiling Joel Osteens every day that act like nothing's wrong. He's not even having church today, you hypocrite! I, I don't know, is he watching now? <laughs> he ain't got nothing else to do. Well, we had a good time on the altar, so I just I want to pray. I've got Paul to talk about. You go study Paul. Paul dealt with it hard. He had a hard life. Okay? which is probably good that he didn't have a wife and kids to drag through it. But he had a rough life. All of them did. But all of them are standing at heaven's gate now, and they're going to cheer you in. They're going to say to you, you did good. See? It's better, isn't it? That's what they're going to tell you. Okay? Let's bow and pray. Father, we had a good time in prayer today. And I'm thankful for it. I needed it. And God, you know the worries in my heart. The struggles. Sleepless nights. Worries. Devils. Father, I'd rather have it that way. Than to have the carefree life. I'll get that one, one of these days. That's coming. But God, you've sustained me. You brought me through the days that I thought I couldn't make it. You used my wife to tell me things I needed to hear. To keep her husband going. Because she needed me to keep going. So, Father, I thank you, God, for using her and the people around me, my family, my friends here, to tell me, Mike, keep going, don't quit, don't stop. And, Father, let that be an encouragement to everybody who hears me today. Don't quit, don't give up, don't stop. You get knocked down, 
God will get you back up. God will get you back up. God, my heart goes out to anybody who has to deal with this every day. Some don't, but some do. And I pray, Heavenly Father, God, that you would just bless them and keep them. And for those, Lord, because of the worries and fears that are going on around right now, that just seem like the whole nation's full of fear. But God, use that to cause your people to pray. And then to open up the word so you can say to us, God, what you want to say to us. And help us to always be hearers and doers of the word. Bless us this morning. We thank you and we love you. Prepare us now for the afternoon service, God, as we study your word. We love you and we ask for your blessing in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. If you stand up, you're dismissed. If you just sit there, you're not.